Hi, my name is Russell Stutley, world's leading pressure point fighting coach. And today I'm going to talk to you about the difference between self-defense and sport. Hi there, the difference between self-defense and sport. Well, first of all, we need to look at what's the same. Which bits fit where? Now, many, many years ago, I stole a, a phrase, an idea off an old friend of mine, Pete Constantine, about pigeonholing things. And it's a great way to explain the similarities and the differences between sports and self-defense. Now you've got, if you're a traditional martial artist, you've got all of your techniques. Now some of those techniques are purely for sport. Some of those techniques may be purely for the art. Some of those techniques can be used for a sports fight and some can be used for a real fight. So you put them all in the little pigeonholes. So you don't take a classical for the art technique and try to apply it in a real fight. You don't take a real sporting technique and try to apply it in a fight. Now, some, and quite a few, in fact, techniques are in one or two or maybe even more pigeonholes. So, for example, you know, a traditional martial arts oizuki type punch to the head is both in a classical form, it's in, the, in there for the art, it's in there for sports fighting, and of course it can be used in a real fight. So you have to decide which of your techniques fit into which pigeonhole. And then, from that perspective, look at the techniques that you can use if you're a sports fighter, obviously for sports fighting, and for a real fight. And you'll notice that if you've got this many techniques for sports fighting, you may only have this many when it comes to a real fight. Some techniques that are perfect for the ring or for the cage may not be so perfect for a street fight. Techniques like some of the different takedowns where you risk the chance of smashing your own head into the floor if you get it a little bit wrong. Maybe not a good idea to take into a street fight just in case you get it wrong and knock yourself out. You've also got to take into account your surroundings, the terrain, is it slippery? Are there other people involved? All of those other things that come into a real fight need to be addressed when you're looking at what techniques you're going to use. Now I've said umpteen times until I'm blue in the face, you know, there's nothing safer than an opponent who's unconscious. Okay? So if it's a real fight, your goal is to knock them out as quickly as humanly possible. And if you're good enough and lucky enough to do that in one strike, fantastic. If not, you're going to have to hit them again and again until you do it, or choke them out, or whatever it is. But you've got to understand that many of the techniques that you have may not necessarily be worthwhile for a self-defense situation. So, if your primary training is self-defense, then look at what you're training and look at what you're trying to achieve with it. Now, of course, we all have times where we're just training for fun and maybe exploring and experimenting and things like that with different techniques 
and it's just good fun to try out some wacky technique just for the hell of it. We all do that, we've all done it, and probably all continue to do it. But you've still got to keep in your mind that some of these wacky ones that you're having fun with, you're not going to really use, they're just for fun. If you're a sports fighter, it's the same sort of thing. Now, you see in sports fights a lot more what you might call wacky techniques appearing as people are getting more athletic, more gifted, uh, more, uh, what's the word, more keen to try out something new because they're not that worried about the consequences. And it's great. But a lot of those techniques that you're seeing in a sports fight would be practically suicidal in a street fight in a real self-defense situation. I've also said many times before that when it comes to a real fight, the last place you want to be is on the floor. Now, I've seen a lot of self-defense stuff out there where people are deliberately taking people down to then finish the fight on the ground. Now, again, that needs to be put in context because if you're a serving police officer or security professional or something like that then maybe you do want to take them down so you can secure them ready for the arrest or to control and restrain. But if you're a civilian and it's a real street fight taking somebody down to the floor when there's the potential of friends and just anybody else joining in and giving you a good kick in while you're down there is probably not the best idea. So again, you've got to take everything into context and see how and why it would apply. And you can use that pigeonhole principle exactly in that scenario. Because a control and restraint, a take down to the floor and getting somebody on the floor and holding them on the floor is something that you may use in competition. It's something that may be used for security officers, police, etc. And it's something that, well, should it really be used for a real fight? That's the sort of thing you've got to make decisions on. So depending on your background, depending on what sort of martial arts you like to do, etc., your techniques will favour one side or the other, striking or grappling or whatever. So you have to be very careful when you're analysing your techniques as to which ones need to be applied in each scenario. Now, every scenario is different. Everything changes in the blink of an eye. So what could just be a simple restrain somebody because they're kicking off a little bit could turn into a life-threatening situation like that. So you have to be aware of all of those things in any real fight anyway. But the important message here is to take your techniques, look at them, analyze them, and decide for yourself which ones should be in which pigeonhole. And sometimes it's good to be pigeonholed. Anyway, hope that's helped. Keep the questions coming and uh, I'll keep answering. Thanks again.